I'm Brenda Wineapple, and my most recent book is Keeping the Faith, God, Democracy, and the Trial that Riveted a Nation. Trials rivet me, as a matter of fact, and that's how I got interested in the Scopes trial of 1925 in America that was covered coast to coast by journalists and even the radio, which was relatively new in 1925. What was going on, I wanted to know, because I had learned a little bit about the Scopes trial, and many people, certainly over a certain age, knew about the trial because of a very famous movie that came out <coughs> in the 20th century called Inherit the Wind, which was based on uh, trial transcripts and also on a play. I was curious what happened, and I'm particularly curious about trials because trials that are called trials of the century, and there were many in the 20th century, really tell us something about the culture in which we live and in which Americans were thrashing out ideas, ideas that were really very important to the way this country was developed and also to the direction it was going in. But let me back up for a minute. In 1925, the Tennessee legislature passed an unusual law, it seemed, called the Butler Act. The Butler Act said that the teaching of the theory of evolution would be prohibited in public schools in the state of Tennessee because it violated or contradicted the theory of creation as told in the Bible. This was unusual and caught the attention of the organization called the American Civil Liberties Union. Someone in the American Civil Liberties Union heard about the Butler Act and brought it to the attention of the head of the ACLU and said this might be a good test case for us because the ACLU was and is dedicated to protecting civil liberties and civil rights. And it seemed that the Butler Act was violating the very right, not just of students to learn, but also because it was contradicting the First Amendment of the Constitution, which argues for the separation of church and state. What happened at that particular point? Two very well-known people, rock stars of the 1920s and earlier, got involved in the trial. One was William Jennings Bryan, long a leader in the Democratic Party, three times a presidential candidate, Secretary of State under Woodrow Wilson, and a Christian fundamentalist who believed that the Bible should be taken literally. He decided to prosecute John Scopes, even though he hadn't really worked as a lawyer in a very long time. But he was a very adept politician, and he was a real believer, and he really felt that schools were grooming children to be atheists and therefore losing their moral way. On the side of the defense, besides the ACLU, was another rock star, Clarence Darrow, who'd been known for over 20 years as a labor lawyer and a criminal attorney, um, who was himself uh, a very unusual man and an agnostic, and he decided to take up the trial pro bono because he himself felt that a, that a law like this not only violates the separation of church and state, but it also robs people of the freedom to think, to learn, and to practice or not practice religions as they saw fit. So here you have two very large, unusual people drawing attention to the trial. And then even though that in and of itself is unusual, there's still another question that I think is worth asking, and that is, what was so interesting to people? What moved them so deeply? Because most of the people in Dayton, Tennessee, and in the West Coast and the East Coast, they weren't really thinking about evolution. Evolution was something that had been around for a very long time and seemed as incontrovertible 
as the theory of gravity. But what really was going on was something about change, something about the fear of change. Much had been changing in the country for several years, for decades in fact, because of all kinds of new theories, theories about science, theories about the unconscious, theories about um, how we should live our lives and where we're going. And as a result of that, um, this trial came to symbolize a great deal about what American culture was and would be. These kinds of issues are very much with us today. Whether we're talking about what should be taught in schools, what books, if any, should be banned, who should decide what scientific theories should be understood, and even what religious texts we might read. Um, and some of the same issues that were upsetting and disturbing and motivating and stimulating people about the nature of the country, the way it was going, the d direction it should take, those were questions that were being asked in 1925 in the same way they might be asked today in very similar circumstances, perhaps not with rock stars arguing back and forth, but nonetheless they enter into our cultural and political network and conversation over and over again. So this is why this trial fascinated me and I think is a fascinating example of how ideas about who we are, what direction we're taking, are talked about in a small arena called a courtroom, a courtroom drama, in fact.